Welcome. I'm Rick Carney, coordinator for the Great Basin Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Today's webinar is being co-hosted by the Great Basin, Great Northern, Plains and Prairie Potholes, and the Southern Rocky LCC. For those of you who may be new to the LCC, we are partnerships among public and private groups that are working together to meet large-scale conservation challenges. We have an exciting presentation for you today on the science framework associated with the Department of the Interior's new Rangeland Conservation and Restoration Strategy. We have two speakers, Dr. Gene Chambers of the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station and Steve Hanser from the U.S. Geological Survey. Before we get started, I have a few instructions on how this webinar platform works. Since there are so many people taking part in the webinar today, we need you to stay in listen-only mode. If you have questions, we ask that you type them in the chat box as they arise. We will read out your questions for the speakers at the end of the presentation. Where is that chat box, you might ask? Well, clicking. If you go on your screen, you'll notice a small collapsed control panel in the upper right-hand corner. By clicking on the small arrow button, you can expand that control panel And in this expanded control panel, you can send in your question. Simply type your question into the chat area near the bottom and press send. The question will be sent to us to respond to at the end of the webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded and made available for fu future viewing on our website. Well, I would like now to introduce today's speakers, Dr. Gene Chambers and Steve Hanser. Gene Chambers is a research plant ecologist with the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station, based at the Great Basin Ecology Lab in Reno, Nevada. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, and the author of over 100 scientific books, papers, and technical reports in the field of plant ecology. Her research focuses on plant species, community, and ecosystem responses to environmental change, resulting from disturbance, climate, or invasive species and in applying this information to problems in restoration ecology. Steve Hanser is a wildlife biologist and sage grouse specialist with the U.S. Geological Survey. Steve formerly worked at the USGS Snake River Field Station in Boise, Idaho, where he studied the effects of habitat composition and configuration, anthropogenic disturbance, and land cover change on the distribution and abundance of sagebrush-associated wildlife populations. His expertise in ecology excuse me, landscape ecology and geospatial analysis have been instrumental in the development of the science framework. I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Jean Chambers. Well, thank you, Rick, for that very nice introduction. And thanks to the LCCs for the opportunity to present our work on the science framework. Our topic today is a science framework for assessing threats to sagebrush ecosystems and greater sage grouse and prioritizing conservation and restoration actions. The science framework is part of the Conservation and Restoration Strategy for DOI Secretarial Order 3336. The Secretarial Order was issued by DOI Secretary Sally Jewell in January of 2015. It was intended to enhance policies and strategies for preventing and suppressing rangeland fire and restoring rangeland landscapes affected by fire in the western U.S. Priority was placed on sagebrush ecosystems and greater sage grouse habitat, and the intent was to allocate resources and assets to reflect that priority. The implementation plan for the Secretarial Order and Integrated Rangeland Fire Management Strategy that you see here um, was then issued in May of 2015. The Conservation and Restoration Strategy is one of the action items in the plan. It is intended to guide the development of scientific information and tools for prioritizing areas for management, to inform options for management activities across multiple scales, to provide clear linkages to existing assessments and plans, and then to inform budget prioritization and adaptive management. The science framework is intended to provide a holistic, science-based foundation for assessing resource values and threats in the sagebrush biome. It builds on the ecosystem's values and risks 
that are identified in the conservation restoration strategy in order to evaluate conservation and restoration opportunities and to use that information to prioritize areas for management. The framework is closely linked to the other components in the implementation plan. These focus in on sagebrush ecosystems and sage grouse, specifically in terms of invasive species and restoration. They address fire and fuels management and suppression. They also include the seed strategy and the actionable science plan, which is in the process of being finalized. And in addition, they relate, the, the framework relates to the monitoring crosscut and the data and geospatial crosscuts in that implementation plan. And for our purposes in the science framework, we're also adding in a climate change component. Now, in terms of mitigation, the framework is also intended to inform those mitigation strategies that were included in the land use plan amendments. The purpose of the mitigation strategies are to promote a consistent approach in determining mitigation requirements across the range of greater sage grouse to use the best available science in prioritizing those mitigation locations and then to inform strategies at project scales. The science framework can inform these goals by providing a process, data layers, and models to help ma managers both target those areas for management and determine the most appropriate management strategies. Now, the basis for the science framework is really the concepts of resilience and resistance. Resilience is the capacity of an ecosystem to reorganize and regain its characteristic processes and functions after disturbance. Or in other words, it is a measure of its recovery potential. Resistance to invasive plants is particularly important in our sagebrush ecosystems, and resistance to invasive plants is the capacity of an ecosystem to prevent increases in invasive plant population. Now, the overall approach for our framework comes from two Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency working groups. These groups were interdisciplinary and multi-organizational. They included state and federal agencies and also universities. The first team was a fire and invasive team. It focused in on the western portion of the range and it used resilience and resistance concepts to reduce impacts to invasive annual grasses and altered fire regimes, and it focused in sagebrush ecosystems and greater sage grouse. The results of this team's effort was published in 2014 in the general technical report you see here on the left. The second team was our sagebrush resilience and re sagebrush management resilience and resistance team, or our SMART team, that focused in on the eastern portion of the range. They also used resilience and resistance concepts, but they focused in on managing threats in general to sagebrush ecosystems, Gunnison sage grouse, and greater sage grouse. This particular general, talk, general technical report is in press, and we hope to see it released by the end of October. Now, the approach used by these two WAFWA working groups um, really was subsequently incorporated into the language for the secretarial order. It was also incorporated into the language for that integrated rangeland fire management strategy. This approach has been used as a basis for a BLM-led fire and invasives assessment tool, or what many of you may know as FIAT, and this tool then served as the basis for developing a multi-year program of work in the Great Basin. The approach is also being used as the basis for a Forest Service FIAT process that is being completed for each of the forests with sage-grouse habitat. The science framework that we're talking about today builds on both the Western and the Eastern Range efforts as well as lessons learned from both of the FIAT processes. The scope of the science framework is really the sagebrush biome. The first version of our science framework focuses in on sagebrush ecosystems and greater sage grouse. It is intended that in subsequent versions, it will include other species at risk 
as well as other resources and values. Now, there's a WAFWA and Fish and Wildlife Service Sagebrush Science Initiative that is ongoing that will help to identify the species at risk within the Great Basin and then also to develop the necessary data sets for more detailed and comprehensive assessments of those species. Other aspects that are intended to be included in subsequent versions of the science framework and the conservation restoration strategy are greater sage grouse brood rearing habitat, big game migratory corridors and seasonal habitat, as well as riparian areas and cultural values. Now, this shows what we're talking about by the eastern and the western range. The map you're looking at shows the sagebrush biome and the greater sage grouse occupied range overlaid by the different management zones and then also the level three EPA ecoregions. In the east, we have management zone one, which is the west central semi-arid prairies. Management zone two is the Wyoming basin and middle and southern Rockies. And then management zone seven, the Colorado plateau and southern Rockies. In the west, we have management zone three, central basin and range and the Wasatch and Uinta mountains. Management zone four, northern basin and range and middle Rockies five, Eastern Cascades and the Northern Basin and Range, and then finally, Management Zone 6, which is the Columbia Plateau. Now, this map is intended to show that the Eastern and Western Ranges have strong environmental differences. Consequently, these differences influence their ecosystem dynamics as well as the dominant management strategies. Here, you're looking at the percent of summer rain overlaid by the fire perimeters from 2000 to 2013 for each month of the year. The su summer precipitation percentage influences not only brome grass invasion like cheatgrass, but also the timing and extent of fires across the western United States. This in turn influences the annual grass fire cycle and its development in the west. What this shows is that the areas with predominantly winter precipitation have larger fires that mostly burn in July through September. Those areas with more summer precipitation tend to have fewer fires and there are more early season fires before the summer monsoons. Now, the threats that we're including in the science framework were identified in the Fish and Wildlife Service Conservation Objectives Team Report that was published in 2013. These include persistent ecosystem threats and then also land use and development threats. The primary emphasis in the western portion of the range was on invasive annual grasses, conifer expansion, and altered fire regimes, those persistent ecosystem threats. Now the map on the right shows a newly released um, coverage of cheatgrass cover that was developed by Janelle Downs and her colleagues. Essentially what this is based upon is remotely sensed data, specifically the normalized vegetation index. Um, although it, it clearly points out the problem that we've seen in the West and some of the expansion in the Colorado Plateau, some of our colleagues in the East um, want us to remember that this is also a significant emerging problem in the eastern portion of the range. Now, in the eastern portion of the range, we did also include the land use and development threats. These, of course, are things like cropland conversion, oil and gas development, ex-urban development, improper livestock grazing, and recreation. And the map on the right essentially shows you the percentage of tilled agriculture across the sagebrush biome in various increments. I wanted to again note that for the science framework, we are including a climate change component and addressing the effects on ecosystems and species. The multi-scale approach that we're using in the science framework includes the sagebrush biome, as well as the sage grouse management zones and ecoregions and local planning areas. There are multiple data 
there, there is a variety of data and tools available to assess these particular areas that have been developed by the partners that you see at the bottom of the screen. These data tools and models are really scale dependent and they're additive. If we look first at the sagebrush biome, we know that we have a variety of vegetation layers such as land fire, we have our soil surveys, as well as we have population data and models, at least for sage grouse and are developing them for other species. We also have a variety of threat data and we have climate change projections. If we step down to that mid-level sage grouse management zones and ecoregions, the data that we've acquired for the sagebrush biome are still relevant, but in addition, we have more detailed assessments and planning documents and more detailed regional data as well. Stepping down again to the local planning area, all of the above data are still relevant, but at this point, we have additional local scale data on things like brood rearing habitat and other relevant values. Now, it's intended in the science framework that the assessments to prioritize planning areas will be conducted primarily at the sage grouse management zone or ecoregional scale. These assessments then will be rolled up, if you will, to the sagebrush biome scale for budget prioritization within the Department of Interior, and these will ensure for range-wide consistency in terms of funding allocation. If we step down to the local planning area, these assessments are intended to provide those areas um, that will be the focus of management treatments and in the local planning areas, that is when the opportunity will exist for selecting the most appropriate treatments. Now, there are six components to this multi-scale approach. It basically develops an understanding of ecosystem resilience and re resistance for the planning region and couples that with key habitat indicators. These two sets of data then are combined with the key threats in the planning area in order to develop management decision matrices that can be used to delineate focal habitats and also to determine the most appropriate management approaches. Now, the basis for our understanding of resilience and resistance begins with the observation that sagebrush ecosystems occur over strong environmental gradients. If we look first at the cold deserts, which you see here, work by my colleagues and myself shows that sagebrush ecosystems range from relatively warm and dry Wyoming big sagebrush types at low elevations to cold, moist mountain big sagebrush types at high elevations. We can also see from this diagram that as temperature decreases, available moisture and productivity increase over these same elevation gradients. As a result, both resilience to disturbance and resistance to invasive annual grasses like cheatgrass increase over these same gradients. Now, in the semi-arid prairies, essentially our management zone one, sagebrush ecosystems range from warm and dry summer moist soils characterized by Wyoming big and silver sage, and then also a mixture of cool and warm season grasses. They range to cold and summer moist areas with warm and cool season grasses and only a minor component of silver sagebrush. As for the cold deserts, both productivity and soil moisture increase over these environmental gradients. As a result, resilience to disturbance and resistance to non-native invasive plant species also increases. Now, because of the strength of the relationships between those soil temperature and moisture regimes, our dominant sagebrush ecosystems, and resilience to disturbance and resistance to invasive annual grasses, we can essentially use soil temperature and moisture regimes as a landscape indicator of resilience and resistance. For both the cold deserts and the west central semi-arid prairies, we identified the dominant ecological types and characterize them based on their soil temperature and moisture regimes and relative resilience and resistance. For the cold deserts in the eastern portion of the range, which you see here, we see that our cool and summer moist types 
or frigid oostic in soil terminology, are characterized by mountain big sagebrush, shrubs such as bitterbrush and snowberry, and cool season grasses. They have moderate to high resilience and resistance. We can contrast that with our warm and summer moist to dry types or our xeric oostic to aridic types. Um, and we see that these are characterized by Wyoming big sagebrush and primarily cool season grasses. Resilience is moderate to low and resistance is low. As part of the process of identifying these dominant ecological types, we also developed state and transition models for the types that describe management strategies based on the, on the characteristics of the particular types as well as their relative resilience and resistance. This map shows the soil temperature and moisture regimes for the range of sage grouse. It was developed from NRCS soil survey data and its use as an indicator of resilience and resistance is described in a new publication by Jer Jeremy Maestas and others. The cool colors, essentially the blues and purples, indicate relatively cold and moist soil temperature and moistures with higher resilience and resistance. The warmer colors, red and orange, indicate relatively warm and dry soil temperature and moistures with lower resilience and resistance. As for most large-scale data products, the soil temperature and moist regimes have certain discrepancies, like the one you see at the Montana-Wyoming border. This occurred because of a natural transition in soil temps, temperatures, and a difference in terms of how the two states interpreted those soil temperature and moisture regimes. Our, Earth, our Eastern Range Working Group resolved this in a series of calls with NRCS soil scientist Steve Campbell and the managers that work in that particular area. The final product was a classification of soil temperature and moisture regimes according to high, moderate, and low resilience and resistance. This map goes a long way in terms of explaining the differences among the east and west in persistent ecosystem threats. The warmer and drier shrub-dominated ecosystems in the west are much more susceptible to invasive annual grasses. They exhibit larger and more frequent wildfires than the cooler and moister systems in the east that receive more summer precipitation and are characterized by higher amounts of grasses. Of course, when we step down to the ecoregion and project planning area, we can add in soil moisture subclasses and further refine this classification. Now, in order to link our understanding of resilience and resistance with information on sage grouse habitat, we use the modeled greater sage grouse breeding habitat probabilities that Kevin Doherty and his colleagues developed. This map shows you the greater sage grouse breeding habitat probabilities based on a multivariate model. This model considered breeding bird densities in relation to general habitat characteristics like landscape cover of sagebrush and conifers, climate, landform, and then also the predominant disturbances. In order to use these data to prioritize areas for management, we classified these probabilities based on the proportion of active versus inactive LECs. 0.25 to 0.5, or yellow, has low suitability. 0.5 to 0.75, purple, has moderate suitability. And greater than 0.75, or blue, has high breeding habitat suitability. This approach is a significant improvement over looking at just one habitat variable, like landscape cover of sagebrush, because it incorporates not only habitat variables, but also the threats. We combined our understanding of resilience and resistance with the sage-grouse breeding habitat probabilities in the sage-grouse habitat matrix, which you're looking at here. The matrix effectively allows us to prioritize areas for management across large landscapes and to determine management actions based not only on the modeled sage-grouse breeding habitat, but also on their resilience to disturbance and resistance to invasive annuals like cheatgrass. The rows show relative resilience and resistance of sagebrush ecological types. The columns show the probability of sage grouse breeding habitat. If we look first 
at the row with high resilience and resistance, we see that our cool and moist mountain big sagebrush types have high restoration and recovery potential. Native grasses and forbs are typically sufficient for recovery. The risk of annual invasives is low, but conifer expansion can be a local issue. And then seeding success is typically high. If we contrast that with our relatively warm and dry Wyoming big sagebrush systems with low resilience and resistance, we see that restoration and recovery potential is typically low. Native grasses and forbs are often inadequate for recovery, and the risk of our annual invasive grasses is high. Seeding success often depends on site characteristics, the abundance of those invasives, and the relative precipitation. These particular areas may require multiple management interventions in order to restore them. Now, if we look next at the columns, we can integrate our understanding of resilience and resistance with sage grouse breeding habitat. In areas with low probabilities, which you're looking at here in the box, the landscape characteristics may be limiting due to past disturbance and habitat fragmentation. These are areas where significant restoration may be needed to increase the probability of supporting sage grouse. However, that really doesn't preclude management activities such as fire suppression or post-fire rehabilitation to protect other important resource values. In areas with medium habitat probabilities, as shown here, we may be able to improve habitat suitability through active management. For example, in areas with moderate to high resilience, that are exhibiting conifer expansion, we may be able to use conifer removal to both release understory sagebrush vegetation and decrease habitat fragmentation. In areas with low resilience, seeding or transplanting sagebrush may be used to decrease fragmentation and again, increase habitat suitability. Other activities that apply regardless of our resilience and resistance categories are managing livestock to increase native grasses and forbs, and then also using early detection and rapid response for invasive plant species. Finally, in areas with high habitat suitability, management focuses on maintaining and increasing resilience and resistance. Activities across the resistance and resilience categories may include conservation easements to maintain or increase connectivity, preventative fire management activities, such as fuel breaks to prevent ecosystems from crossing critical thresholds, and of course, actively managing livestock and practicing early detection and rapid response. Low resistance and resilience categories, the low resistance and resilience categories are among the highest priorities for management within that high breeding bird probability. This is because they are often at highest risk of both invasive species, invasive species such as cheatgrass, and also wildfire. These areas, again, are among the highest priorities for management. However, we again need to recognize that they may require added investments and more than one intervention. We can use geospatial maps and data to target areas for prioritization using those cells in the sage-grouse habitat matrix. This map essentially displays the greater sage-grouse habitat matrix. The first filter here are the priority areas for conservation, and you, you see them outlined uh, throughout the map. The colors match those in the matrix. Once we have the packs we essentially overlay the resilience and resistance categories with the breeding habitat probabilities. Here, blue reflects high resilience and resistance, yellow moderate, and red low. The darker colors indicate high breeding habitat probabilities. This map shows the habitats most likely to support birds, and it can be linked directly to those management strategies discussed for the different cells in the matrix. For example, Areas in dark red are at high risk of invasive annual grasses and altered fire regimes. 
and are of particular importance for preventative management actions like fire suppression, conifer removal and expansion areas, and early detection and rapid response for invasive plants. We can further target management areas by looking directly at the breeding bird densities in conjunction with resilience and resistance. High density areas are those that support 80% of the breeding population in this particular map, and low density areas support the remaining population. Including high density areas ensures that priority areas for management have the capacity to support large populations, provide necessary connectivity among the different populations, and are close enough to those breeding centers to allow recolonization after treatment. Now when we step down to the land planning unit, either at the regional or local scale, we can use many of the same data layers, our resilience and resistance, those breeding habitat probabilities, and the sage-grouse breeding populations. At this point, however, we also want to overlay the predominant threats for the planning area. We can use regional risk models as well as finer scale data. It's also important to recognize that at this particular point, that regional local expertise becomes particularly important in terms of focusing those project areas and determining the most appropriate treatments. This shows an example of stepping down for an area in southwest Wyoming that is exhibiting oil and gas development. As the map on the left, our soil temperature and moisture map shows, this is an area with strong elevation gradients. It ranges from cold and moist areas with high resilience and resistance to warm and dry bordering on summer moist areas with low resilience and resistance. Land ownership is BLM, state, and private. Now, large parts of this area are exhibiting active oil and gas development, and you can particularly see this in the area just south of Pinedale. Large parts of this area have high breeding bird densities, and you can see that as the dark yellow, dark blue, and dark red. And the bulk of these areas tend to have moderate to low resilience and resistance. In terms of management strategies, we would want to avoid development and transportation corridors in areas with high populations. One one particular management activity that is illustrated here on the right is the establishment of conservation easements, and that also can help with decreasing fragmentation. In addition, we'd want to consider using early detection and rapid response for invasive plants. Because of the amount of disturbance in this area, it is exhibiting a high number of plant invaders. Another activity is to improve grazing management especially in lower resilience and resistance areas. By maintaining those perennial cool season grasses, we can increase the ability to resist some of the invasive annual grasses that are starting to move into this area. And finally, we would want to use our best restoration practices, including things like weed-free seed. This shows a second example. This one's in northeast Nevada. It's an area where we're seeing conversion to cheatgrass, large fires, and then also localized areas with conifers. If we look first at our soil temperature and moisture map on the left, we see that this is a cold to cool and moist area with high to moderate resilience and resistance, um, and then a large component of essentially warm and dry areas with low resilience and resistance. Ownership is BLM, Forest Service, state, and private. We have relatively new data layers for some of these areas. The near real-time cheatgrass data layer that was recently developed by Voigt et al. shows the percentage of cheatgrass cover in these areas. And if we look at the area around Elko and the areas to the north, um, we see that it is an increasing problem in terms of fairly significant areas converting to cheatgrass dominance. 
If we look at our fire perimeters from our MTBS data, we see that we've had some fairly significant fires in the past few decades. And then finally, our percent canopy cover of pinion and juniper um, is derived essentially from a new data layer developed by Falkowski et al. that is in press. And what it shows us is that we do have some significant localized conifer expansion um, within some of the packs, especially down to the south. Now, if we look at essentially our resilience and resistance and our breeding bird densities, we see that the areas within the packs that have high breeding bird densities occur over a broad range of resilience and resistance. And if we think back to our other cover layers, we know that some of these areas are adjacent to areas that are being converted to cheatgrass and also areas that are exhibiting significant conifer expansion. In terms of management strategies, we have slightly different strategies than we had in the eastern portion of the, of the range. We're looking at things like strategic fire suppression and fuels management. The upper right hand photograph essentially shows you a, a fuel break. Many of these can be implemented adjacent to areas that have a risk of fire moving from cheatgrass dominated areas into our sagebrush dominated ecosystems to prevent conversion to cheatgrass and then also maintain sagebrush ecosystem connectivity. Of course, another management strategy is targeted tree removal in those phase one and phase two pinion and juniper expansion areas. Other strategies post-fire rehabilitation that promotes those native perennial grasses and forbs that can help resist some of those invasive annual grasses that are continuing to expand in this area. And then finally, livestock management that helps maintain our native perennial grasses and forb communities. Now, in recent years, we've developed a series of tools to aid managers in terms of being able to select the most appropriate management treatments. Um, two of these that you see here are field guides that focus in on selecting the most appropriate treatments in sagebrush and pinion juniper ecosystems, as well as another field guide that was recently published that provides a rapid assessment for post wildfire recovery potential in sagebrush and pinion and juniper. One of the unique things about these field guides is that they essentially step managers through the process of evaluating the relative resilience and resistance for their particular project areas. It's based upon many of the factors we talked about today, soil temperature and moisture regime, as well as the dominant species in the area. Other management tools that have recently come out are two restoration handbooks for sagebrush ecosystems. One of these focuses in on the concepts for understanding and applying restoration. It's based largely on our resilience and resistance concepts. A second one focuses in on some of those landscape level restoration decisions that we've been talking about today. There's a host of other good information that is being developed and I just want to point to two of those that were released this summer. One focuses in on using soil survey material to assess sagebrush ecosystem resilience and resistance. And then one that just came out last week was essentially our Great Basin Fact Sheet Series for 2016. It covers a variety of topics, including the most effective methods for establishing sagebrush species, and then also the most effective methods for combating species like Medusa head and restoring native, native communities in those particular areas. And with that, I think we're ready to move on to Steve Hanser, who's going to talk about the geospatial portal and the decision tools that are being developed. Let's see if I can get this to work here. And you should be seeing that again. 
Well, thanks, Jean. Um, I'm going to be presenting some information here about a parallel process um, that has been under development as part of the Integrated Rangeland Fire Management Strategy. Shown here at the bottom of the screen is the URL for the BLM Landscape Approach Data Portal, uh, which is the location for accessing all of this great data that jean has been uh, presenting uh, so far in the presentation today. I'll put this URL up back um, several times here over the course of my presentation. So if it'll switch my slide here, there we go. So um, as Gene was presenting at the beginning, um, there's a series of different actions that were outlined in the Integrated Land and Fire Strategy. Um, one of those uh, cross-cutting actions was the development of a geospatial framework that highlights the areas of concern and priority habitats in the sagebrush ecosystem. The geospatial framework team was co-led by USGS and BLM and includes representatives from the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, NRCS, and the Forest Service. Um, this process, uh, this team has developed uh, a process to bring together data to facilita facilitate informed landscape decision, landscape skill decision making. So um, as Gene brought up earlier, there's, there's some things that were outlined specifically within the integrated land management fire strategy for this cross-cutting action. The first was the development of a geospatial tool to highlight the areas of sagegrass habitat uh, with a focus on the Great Basin. And resistance and resilience of the habitats is a core concept uh, throughout the, the rangeland fire strategy and is an important focus of the geospatial data uh, as well. The second piece of the task was the development of a common framework. Um, so the geospatial data is at the core of many of the management strategies, as you've been seeing here today. And um, that, that data can provide a context for local decision making. Increasingly, the scale of data um, is also improving to the point where we can inform uh, those types of local decision making as well. The development of a common framework across DOI for geospatial data, this can lay the foundation for integrated decision making that helps uh, that incorporates concepts from science and management across uh, disciplines. This common framework um, also can assist the end user by providing a resource for identifying the correct version or location of uh, for data access uh, because it can be often be difficult to um, find the data that you're interested in uh, with all the numerous access points and originating um, agencies. So this framework um, can help integrate data across uh, both departmental agency boundaries. Um, and ge this geospatial framework provides a single landing page to access authoritative data uh, from uh, a series or many different uh, source data providers. The team has developed a catalog of curated data content focused on the sagebrush ecosystem, rangeland fire, um, and including um, diff information from uh, access points, uh, and it, it provides a, a primary access point for the data derived um, within the science framework, and I will show you um, that access point in just a minute. The site currently contains an easy-to-use catalog for data access for both geospatial and non-geospatial users, and a number of visualization tools that can provide access, particularly for those non-geospatial spatial users who want to look at these data layers or for those uh, geospatial uh, users that just want a, an easy to use interface. So how was this developed? The team leveraged existing resources of BLM and USGS as the primary building blocks. First, the BLM Landscape Approach Data Portal provides the outward face of the geospatial framework. Uh, this site is the home for the landscape-focused data uh, within the Bureau of Land Management and it is the source for uh, BLM developed and um, those data sets that are managed by the BLM. Uh, I lift, again, I've listed the, the URL for this site here. In order to bridge between multiple agencies, we're using USGS ScienceBase. This site contains uh, data sets including information from a large uh, landscape scale efforts down to individual project level information. Uh, this is the repository for uh, USGS um, data through uh, the new open uh, data policy within the Bureau. 
verified partners are allowed access to post data on this site, and it is an open platform and therefore provides an ideal bridge to bring together data uh, for multiple agencies. So uh, this is the um, site that I've been talking about. So, uh, shown here is the Secretarial Order 3336 tab on the Landscape Approach Data Portal. I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the functions and invite you to access the site um, after our presentation today. Um, I've, re I've refrained from uh, using the dreaded live demo for simplicity's sake. So first, um, I pop up here um, is access to the, the curated data catalog. We have two separate um, sections. The first on the top, it contains access to um, the set of data uh, that serves uh, multiple actions uh, within the secretarial order. And the second below is focused on the science framework for the conservation and restoration strategy data um, that uh, we've been talking about here today. So I'll just click into the secretarial order uh, data access tab. As you can see here, there's a large number of data sets and we have 105 records in this, uh, this list. Uh, this information includes uh, information for the fee assessments, um, the USGS grass shrub stewardship mapping, and a number of other layers. I will point out that this 105 layers is a subset of the potential data that, that's out there. Within the landscape approach data portal, a search for sagebrush would result in 418 results and on science base, 1,077. So this is a demonstration of the curated data set that's being provided by this effort. If we then click back out here, uh, we can then go into the conservation and restoration strategy downloadable data. This contains 36 records. Uh, this data um, is access to both the raw data that was used to develop um, the information Gene has presented um, here so far today, as well as the derived data sets that are in those figures um, and provide the basis for the science framework. If we then look here at one individual record, this is the greater sage grouse breeding habitat probability layer. Um, this forms the, the basis for the columns in the sage grouse habitat matrix Gene um, has presented here. As you can see, there are options here to open, preview, as well as see some of the details and metadata. So if we just click on open, we can go into uh, the record. And this takes us directly into the USGS science base. Uh, for the access to the data. Uh, this record provides summary data as well as multiple options for accessing the individual data sets. Uh, this data set shown here uh, is currently available for download, shown here at the bottom uh, through the zip function, or through a multiple spatial services including ArcGIS web mapping services as well as um, additional web mapping services and um, open, open source services. Uh, for those uh, geospatial users that want access directly to the data. So we then click at back out to the main page. You can see there are multiple other um, functions out here that I want to show uh, briefly. So if we go in here, we can look down in the bottom right corner, and there's a toolbox. Um, so within this toolbox, there currently are a number of viewers. Uh, the top one here, the Sage Brush Assessment and Geospatial Evaluation Viewer, or SAGE Viewer. Uh, we have the Fire Invasives Assessment Tool Viewer, and we also have links out to the SAGE Grouse Initiative Interactive Map. So the, the SAGE Viewer is also shown right here at left. We can go in and go into the, the viewer, um, the full screen viewer. You can see that this provides uh, an, an easy to use interface uh, that has been developed to visualize the data that's contained within the geospatial framework. If you're familiar with the GIS, this is a familiar inter interface. And uh, for those that are not, this provides um, some functionality and access to data without the need uh, for software on your own computer. Layers can be turned on and off, and you can also zoom into an area of interest. We've had many requests for uh, mobile capability, and this interface can be accessed through your mobile device and uh, can Put you can geolocate you on the map information. So we understand we need to continue to develop the toolbox. Uh, the team 
continues to develop visualization tools to provide access to additional data, including those uh, that were developed as part of the science framework. Development of decision support tools is also underway through a multi-agency effort. These types of tools will provide support for large-scale assessment and prioritization efforts. And as Jean has discussed, uh, these product, products also can help assist with regional or project-level planning efforts. So I wanted to briefly show an example of the type of tool being developed. Uh, this is an example uh, that was developed for the Wyoming Basin Rapid Eco Regional Assessment. And uh, this is the a type of analysis we commonly refer to as what's in the box. Um, so the user can go in here and select an area of interest and get summary statistics to help inform their decision making process. The area selected here uh, may be, for example, a proposed project area. Once the user selects the area, they submit and receive stati the statistics um, through this easy-to-use interface. If we then um, go into the example output, uh, the statistics have been run for that individual area that was highlighted and is uh, sent back to the user as both tabular or, or graphical um, format. The information um, is provided, um, included, shown here, for the terrestrial development index. And a number of different statistics have been developed for other things, including land ownership, uh, terrestrial communities, plants, fire currents, uh, conservation potential, et cetera. In the, ta in the table, you can see there's the submitted project, which is just within your area. But it also provides information for the, the region. So you know um, it gives you some context for uh, making that decision. Um, so if we then go back out to the main page, there's a series of these types of tools that are under development. And um, I would invite you to stay tuned for those. Um, as they become available, they will be added to the toolbox um, shown here on this main page. If you um, would like to continue to access the information, please um, go to this URL shown here at the bottom of the screen. and um, the geospatial data and tools um, are already being used uh, to uh, provide this for decision making and landscape prioritization. So the, the approach um, described within the FIAT and SMART uh, GTRs and science framework um, are being implemented. Um, the BLM has used their, their own FIAT process uh, with multiple partners to identify project uh, priority areas for greater sage-grouse management um, across the Great Basin. Um, this was based largely on the work of WAFWA, the WAFWA Working Group, and the approach described in the uh, Forest Service GTR 326. These data um, shown here in the blue and orange dots are from the uh, NIFPOR system. And um, they show that funding uh, for management activities has increased in uh, many of the high priority areas from the 2013 um, accomplished areas on the left shown in the blue to the FY16 planned shown in the um, orange dots here. You can see that the expenditure has increased and is largely focused within those planning areas. So I am now going to pass back to Jean, and she's going to talk about Forest Service implementation and some of the next steps on the science framework. Thanks, Steve. And hopefully you can all see the slide that says Forest Service Fire and Invasives Assessments. I wanted to let everybody know that the Forest Service is conducting its own FIAT processes in the regions that support sage grouse. The approach essentially uses the same basic concepts described in the GTRs and that was used by the BLM, but it differs in terms of the actual process. A risk analysis and a scoring process are used to develop the prioritization that is used. Um, all sage-grouse habitat is included regardless of its designation, and it is being conducted on an individual forest basis. Many of the forests, or several of them, have been completed um, as of July of this year. And then another series of forests, and I'd say about half of them, 
will be completed in 2017. Now, in terms of the timeline for our science framework, we've already completed version one of the science framework and the provisional data layers that Steve has been discussing are available. Version one of the science framework is available in this UR, from this URL, essentially on TreeSearch, and it is available as an unnumbered publication through Rocky Mountain Research Station. It was made available at the same time as the data on the geospatial portal, and that was around July 22nd. We're looking forward to the Eastern Range General Technical Report being published by the end of October. And then we're also looking forward to a WAFLA and BLM Conservation and Restoration Workshop that will be held in early November. This is intended to further the work that's being done on the conservation and restoration strategy for the BLM, as well as a conservation and restoration strategy that is being developed through WAFLA. It is our intent to have the science framework that we discussed today in press by the middle of December. I wanted to acknowledge the science framework teams. You've heard primarily about part one today. It focuses in on the science approach and the applications. Um, this shows you the writing team and also the reviewers who actually have already looked at that version one. The science framework is also going to have a part two that is currently being developed. It focuses in on management activities and the different components are climate change, fire, invasives, a seed strategy section, and then also monitoring and mitigation. And this shows you the writing team leads. And with that, I think we're ready to turn it over to Liz and open it up for discussion. Great. Thanks to both of you. Um, we have a handful of questions that co have come in so far, and I'll remind our audience members that if you have questions for either of the speakers, please enter those into the chat box on your control panel, which you can access by clicking the red arrow to expand. So, Jean, I'll start with a few questions that came for you a little bit earlier in your presentation. Um, the first one was when you were presenting on resistance and resilience priorities. And the question is, is there any concern that when you expand to consider other values, um, that everything will become priority and therefore there is no priority? And the example that they gave was Fish and Wildlife Service and WAFWA um, have identified about 25 additional species beyond the greater sage grouse. Um, so I'll turn that over to you, Jean. Um. I'm not sure that there's a concern that everything will become a priority. However, what it does indicate is that we will also need to go through informed processes to understand what the habitat requirements are for the additional species. One thing that is somewhat reassuring is that when we talk about sage brush dependent species, we know that most of them require continuous cover of sagebrush landscapes. And although they tend to require different amounts depending upon the scale we look at, um, that is one similarity that I think we can use as a commonality. Decreasing fragmentation, increasing connectivity among populations, regardless of what the species are, are going to be viable strategies across the entire range. Um, in terms of other resources, we already know that our riparian areas, those wet areas, are particularly important, and those are already being incorporated into certain planning strategies, and I think that that doesn't necessarily mean that they will be higher priorities um, than some of these other management activities. So hopefully that answered the question. Great, thank you. And here, another question for Eugene, again from a little bit earlier in your presentation. Um, the question is, the presentation focused on breeding areas. Are similar science frameworks being developed for sage grouse nesting and brood rearing areas? And I would um, invite Steve to participate in that, but there are models that are being developed for brood rearing habitat. 
And I would also mention that there are, also, are models being developed for passerines and that are actually about to be published and that hopefully um, we'll be able to incorporate in the science framework, um, if not when this particular version is published, but soon afterwards. Yeah, and Jean, I guess I would just point out that this is setting up a framework for this, this, these types of decision-making processes, and as the models become available for those other um, annual life, annual stages, uh, they can be incorporated into this process. Great, thank you. Um, the next question here is related to recovery potentials. So the question is, how will management efforts be divided between high, mid, and low recovery potentials? Um, for example, will efforts be split 50-50 between protecting healthy habitats and recovering degraded habitats? Will more effort be put into recovery of degraded habitats, or do we not know this yet? Um, I don't think the process is maybe as, um, and I don't want to say simple, but as easy is what I'll say as just um, allocating percentages for different um, resilience and resistance or recovery categories. What needs to happen, as, we, as I hope we tried to indicate today, is that we need to focus in on the individual region and the particular project areas, and I'll remind you of the two examples we went through, and to look at the characteristics of those particular areas and determine what the primary limitations and the primary needs are. Um, then we can better determine which risks we need to assess um, in which resilience and resistance category. Um, we do believe that those low resistance and resilience areas with high breeding probabilities, high continuous cover of sagebrush, are of particular importance because we're losing those the most rapidly. So in many schemes, um, those may float to the surface as being priority areas to, say, put in those um, fire breaks, those fuel breaks, to en enable suppression so that we don't lose those areas so they are not converted to invasive annual grasses um, like cheatgrass. All right, thank you. Um, Steve, a couple questions for you that came up during the geospatial um, portal conversation. The first one here is, can the geoportal import habitat management treatments that um, state fish and wildlife agencies and others are importing into the Fish and Wildlife Service conservation efforts database? Um, so we have not linked into the conservation efforts database, uh, but uh, we have folks from the Fish and Wildlife Service on our team, um, so that might be something that we look at in the future. There is the option of using um, some of the services like ArcGIS Online, uh, which can interface with this data and provide a way to link state-level data with um, some of the data in the, the, geos, the geospatial portal. Um, so there are some, are, are some options of um, putting that data um, on the same map together. Great. And somewhat related um, to the portal again, is there going to, is this going to be integrated with Wildcad at Fire Dispatch so that suppression activities can be tailored to the situation? I guess we, we are interfacing with folks at NIFSI, and so we're, we'll work out the best way to provide the information to help inform the decisions um, that they didn't make within the, the wildfire community. Okay, and one more question about the database here and um, some of its compatibility. So does the GIS database incorporate non-federal lands, in particular those commingled with BLM or um, Forest Service lands? So right, right now we, um, we've taken those um, 105 layers that I um, showed are in, currently in the catalog and they are available for across all lands um, depending upon uh, what the data set is. Um, some of them are focused in on federal federal management decisions, um, but if if the data 
is consistent across the, the entire region. Um, there was no distinction made of, of removing non-federal land from those data sets. Um, so we're using we're using the authoritative data, and if it was um, an all land data set, then all lands are are all the, all those land cover type or the land ownership types are covered in the data. I hope that covered it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, another more general question, and either of you feel free to answer this one: um, How is the strategy being implemented for lands without sage grouse? Well, this is Jay. You want to take that? I'll jump in. Um, of course, that would be a better question for Karen Prentice, I would say, to answer. But the strategy is being implemented in a similar way. What we have done is to write into the science framework essentially an approach for other species at risk or other values. So while we've really focused in on sage grouse, in this particular talk, as Steve was kind of indicating earlier, it is really intended to be an approach that can be used more generally for other species at risk as well as for other values when we begin to get that information. Um, the same different data layers are basically going to be used, um, except that ideally we will have the models, um, for example, for say the passerines. Um, that we would be using instead of those for sage grouse. We would still overlay the various risk layers and at this particular point in time we may also be looking at overlaying things like the continuous cover of sagebrush so that we can better evaluate um, where those areas of connectivity are and where those real important areas are um, for maintaining and managing those areas again for um, preventing fragmentation and maintaining connectivity across the landscape. Did you want to jump in, Steve? That that I think that's that's key. Is as new as new data and layers become available, we can start to um, bring that into the framework and help inform the decision making for those those species. All right, great, and I. Um, somewhat related question here about this kind of scope. Um, the question is, are aquatic invasive species being considered um, for riparian and stream habitats? The primary focus of the science framework to date has been, again, on sagebrush ecosystems, um, speaking literally, sagebrush vegetation types, and then also sage grouse. I, I'm sure as it begins to expand, um, the aquatic invasives will be included. And remember also that there are multiple other components of the um, secretarial order, and one of them is invasive species. And it focuses on all invasive species characteristics. Um, that, I'm assuming, will also be integrated into those management sections that I discussed. There is a management section on invasive species, and I know it is not focused solely on sagebrush vegetation types. OK, great. And another question for, um, for either of you here is, are we seeing an, any increase in the use of these tools as they become available? And do we need to do more targeted outreach for hands-on training? Well, unfortunately, I guess I will go first. Unfortunately, before this presentation, I didn't uh, look into the analytics of how many folks have um, gone on to our onto the geospatial portal that went live. I believe it was on August 18th. So we've uh, this has been out there for about a month, um, and I, I my my hope is as we continue to provide uh, new tools and for the end user that. Um, folks will continue to use this, and this will this will be uh, a source of that authoritative data um, as new information becomes available. It'll be provided out there to the community. And to add on to that, I can tell you that um, I've received multiple requests for various aspects of the data, 
and in particular the soil temperature and moisture regimes. Um, that is being uh, taken, I would say, um, one step farther in a couple of different ways. One is that John Bradford essentially is developing a, a predictive model, if you will, based on soil temperature and moisture regimes. And in order to be able to project resilience and resistance into the future, <clears throat> he's incorporating a climate modeling aspect into that. So there's that particular aspect. The other thing that is occurring is that the soil temperature and moisture regimes as well as the breeding bird habitat probabilities and the breeding bird densities are being used um, already and have been for a while essentially to assess areas for management and then there are a series of workshops that are being conducted in the Great Basin and those are being led at this point in time by Rick Miller and then also Jeremy Maestas to train managers um, how best to use those soil temperature and moisture regimes and the various other overlays um, that we currently have available in terms of selecting appropriate project sites and determining the most appropriate management treatments. So it is being used um, and um, to date uh, we're getting very good feedback that the approach works very well. Great, thank you. Um, Steve, a question from your presentation. Um, when you were speaking to the slide that's labeled example tool, um, it shows kind of tabs with terrestrial communities, plants, and wildlife. Um, where are these data coming from? Those are um, data sets that were, that were developed for the Wyoming Basin Rapid Ecoregional Assessment. And uh, many of those, those data are being hosted on ScienceBase currently. Um, and I believe that the data will be, will be served out of the Landscape Approach Data Portal along with all of the other Rapid Ecoregional Assessment data. Great, thank you. Um, at this point, we have gone through the questions that have come into my chat box here from the audience. If there's anyone else out there that has a question, um, please get that in here now. Um, one that just, oh, okay, a few more are popping up now. So, Steve, um, can you just repeat the URL for USGS's interface website? Um, so it's the, if you do a, a Google search for the Landscape Approach Data Portal, that's probably the easiest way to provide that access. And then the information that I was providing is under the Secretarial Order 3336 tab on that BLM landscape, landscape Approach Data Portal. Great. Thank you here. And um, for those, a few people asked you just about some contact information. I'm just a second we'll get a slide up here that has Gene and Steve's contact information. So if anyone had follow-up questions with that. Um, Gene, a question just came in here for you, which is, was data used to locate the threat of improper livestock grazing on the map? And if so, what data was used or was it a model? Um, no, we have that none of the maps that you saw today um, actually overlaid the risks that would be part of the process that you would go through if you were doing a regional assessment or assessment at the management zone level um, or even at the project zone level. Um, we have not incorporated um, information on livestock use into the geospatial portal, although you can correct me, Steve. I, I believe that Victoria was saying that there, there is use data um, available through the BLM, um, but the short take is that um, no, these were not risk layers that you might think of with multiple data overlays. All of the data that are overlaid were clearly indicated on the maps. Dean, you're correct. On the the access to the grazing grazing information. 
Great. One more question that's come in here for um, either of you. Is there an effort to, for, sorry, to further inform the overall data when studies are done on a higher resolution mapping projects? And how is that data incorporated? That would be incorporated at the regional planning scale level, and then also if there are higher resolution data available when you are doing project planning, then those data should certainly be incorporated. Um, in terms of the FIAT process, um, they actually used um, finer scale data that had been developed by the states for some of their mapping efforts. Great, thank you. Um, once again, one more call for any questions from the audience. That was the last one that I had that had currently come in. So I'll just give folks a moment if they have any other additional questions that they would like to type in to the question box on your control panel. All right, I'm not seeing anything else come in. Um, Rick, I'll go ahead then and turn it over to you. Thanks, Liz, and thank you, Gene and Steve, for an outstanding presentation. Lots of good information here today, and I know I'm going to go back and review the recording to try to glean even more than I was able to pick up on the first uh, time here. And so, audience, I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. As I said, a recording is uh, has been made and will be made available on our website later this week. If you have any questions about the LCC or the science framework presented here, please feel free to contact myself, Gene, or Steve. Our contact information is on the screen. Well, make sure to join us on Wednesday, October 12th at 10 a.m. Pacific Time for a webinar on the use of archaeological data to inform the plans for greater sage grouse conservation with Dr. Brian Hockett and Steve Nelson of the BLM. Last but not least, we really want to know what you thought of today's webinar. When you log off today, you'll be presented with an opportunity to provide a feedback. So please take our short two-minute survey that appears on the screen. Your feedback is most welcome. and helps us to plan and to improve future webinars. So on behalf of the, the four LCCs within the Sage Brush Biome, I want to thank you for taking part in today's webinar, and have a good day.